I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Our second message in this series, beginning the book of Romans, is an important one. This passage is an important one. In 1513, there was a Roman Catholic monk who was lecturing to his seminary students from the book of Psalms. And when he came to Psalm 31, verse 1, he was troubled. He read, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. That phrase, righteousness delivered me, troubled him. It, it was opposite of how he had been trained. It wasn't making sense to him how the righteousness of God could be seen as anything that was positive. So he turns to and begins to study our passage, Romans chapter 1, especially verse 17, and meditate upon it. He would write many years later about this time in his life. He said, I hated that word, the righteousness of God, by which I had been taught according to the customs and use of all teachers, that God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. As a monk, I led an irreproachable life. Nevertheless, I felt that I was a sinner before God. My conscience was restless, and I could not depend on God being satisfied by my works. Not only did I not love, but I actually hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. Thus a furious battle raged within my perplexed conscience. But meanwhile, I was knocking at the door of this particular Pauline passage, earnestly seeking to know the mind of the great apostle. Day and night I tried to meditate upon the significance of these words. The righteousness of God is revealed in it. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In time, God would open Martin Luther's heart and his mind to what this verse meant, and God used it to gloriously save Martin Luther. In fact, it's not an overstatement to say that there is no doubt that this one verse in Romans was used by God to change the trajectory of human history. That's quite a bold statement, but when you consider what this did in the life of Martin Luther, who then is the founder and the initiator of the Reformation and how Ref the Reformation changed the face of Western civilization really for the last 500 years, it's not an overstatement at all. So this morning, as we turn to this passage, we're going to start by digging right into verse 17. Everything in this passage, in fact, everything in this introduction of this letter culminates and builds up to what verse 17 says. In fact, verse 17 is essentially the thesis statement of the entire book of Romans. So we're going to start right there, and then we will make some applications from it to our lives. Verse 17 teaches us something very importantly, that in the gospel, God's righteousness is on full display. He says in verse 17, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And immediately the big question is this, what is the righteousness of God? What's he referring to here? This is what troubled Martin Luther. And by the way, it's still debated today. Depending on the commentary, the scholar that you turn to, they will have a different explanation for the righteousness of God. And the reason why there's this question is because in the Bible, the righteousness of God can have different meanings depending upon the context of the passage. John Stott has done a, a favor to the church in taking all of these different usages of the righteousness of God and summarizing them and putting them into th one of three categories. 
So he says in some instances, the righteousness of God is referring to a divine attribute of God. We see this, for example, in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. By the way, the, the book of Romans has this expression more than 30 times in it. So it's important to understand how's it being used. Well, in verse 25, it's referring to an attribute of God. When it says God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. So in this understanding, as a divine attribute, perfect righteousness is a quality of God. He is righteous in who he is. So that's one category, divine attribute. Then there's the category of divine activity or divine action. You see this oftentimes in the Old Testament. You also see it in the New Testament, especially in the book of Psalms, in the book of Isaiah, you'll see this example of the righteousness of God. In Psalm 71, 2, in your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. In Isaiah, an example of it is bring near my righteousness. I will bring near my righteousness. It is not far off and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. See, God is righteous, and because God is righteous, he is loyal and faithful, as we sang this morning, to his covenant promises and to his covenant people. And because he is righteous in this way, he will powerfully intervene on behalf of his people to deliver them or to rescue them or to save them, even in the spiritual sense of the word. So there's a divine attribute usage, depending on the verse. And in some verses, it's talking about a divine activity or divine action. And the final category that Stott gives us is that of divine achievement. We see this in a verse that I've quoted around here quite a bit. I'll quote it more, I'm sure, in the future. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. This verse tells us God is doing something. He's achieving something, and this righteousness. In other words, he bestows his righteousness on us. God, in this sense of the righteousness of God, is changing our status. He's declaring that we are righteous sons and daughters of God. So which is it in Romans 1.17? Is Paul referring to one of God's characteristics, one of his attributes? Is he referring to how he intervenes and he uh, works and acts and, and does things with humanity? Or is the righteousness of God in verse 17 something that he bestows on us? Which one is it? Well, certainly that last one. Paul has this in mind, he definitely has this in mind at a minimum, that in verse 17, God is declaring us righteous, bestowing on us a God righteousness that we cannot earn, but it only comes to us through Jesus Christ. You know, this is ultimately what changed Martin Luther's life. As he meditated and he studied on Romans 1.17, he came to understand it in this way. And when God opened his eyes and mind to understand that the righteousness of God was not some moral standard that he was supposed to, with all of his effort, to try and live up to, but that instead it was something from outside of himself, an alien righteousness that, that God bestows upon him in his grace through Jesus Christ. Martin Luther said that at that point, it was as if the gates of paradise were swung open to me and I was born again. And this entire trajectory of his life has changed. And, and this is, by the way, a legitimate understanding of verse 17. Other translations, you know, the, the New Testament was written in Greek, and translations that we read in English, a team has looked at the original language, and they bring it over from Greek into English. And many translation teams will come to verse 17, and they translate it in this way. For in the gospel, a righteousness, what's the next word? From. 
a righteousness from God. You see, that, that clarifies it, doesn't it? It's something that is coming from outside of us. God is bestowing upon us his righteousness. A gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. And one of the reasons why translators will do this is because in other places, Paul has explicitly stated it like this. And for example, in Philippians 3 verse 9, he says, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul states it very clearly in Philippians 3, 9, that third category of divine achievement that God is bestowing on us a righteousness that is a God righteousness that we need in order to be reconciled to him. But personally, I think that there's maybe more going on here than just that last understanding. Um, we need to remember that this verse is the thesis verse of the entire book. And so we have to ask the question, what is the book of Romans about? What is the book of Romans focusing on? And, and we may answer that question in different ways. We may say it's about salvation, or it's about justification, or sanctification, or adoption, or predestination, or how Jews and Gentiles get along with one another, or how we're supposed to live within the world that we walk every day, and how we get along with one another, how Jews, I mean, there's all kinds of themes and sub-themes in the book of Romans that Paul addresses. But here's the thing, church. In every theme and sub-theme that Paul brings into this letter, he ultimately ties it into God. God. And so an interesting study was done. Back in 1970, Dr. Leon Morris wrote a paper where he analyzed the book of Romans and all these different theories, and he walked away from this analysis saying, like no other book in the New Testament, the book of Romans, the focus of Romans, is on God. Now you may at first say, wait a second, isn't all the Bible about God? But, but if you think about it, when Paul writes a book to the Corinthians, the focus in the first Corinthians are all the problems that the church in Corinth is having. And yes, God is in the book of first Corinthians, but you wouldn't say that the focus of the book of Corinthians is God. God the Father or the triune God, not at all. You wouldn't say that. But you see, Romans is unlike any other book in the New Testament, even the Gospels. Romans dwarfs the other New Testament books in how often it, re it refers to God. It's not even close. The, the most references to, the, to God in the New Testament are in the book of Acts. Second is the book of Romans, but the book of Romans is much shorter than the book of Acts. For every 100 words in the book of Acts, it's like every 45, 46 words in the book of Romans, God is being mentioned. Paul ties everything back to God. So in this thesis verse, certainly Paul is referring to the righteousness that God bestows on us, but Paul is equally concerned about God, that God, and hear this, is righteous in the bestowing of this righteousness and that this bestowed righteousness actually does something. That it actually accomplishes something. That he actually is able to deliver us. So you see all three categories being unpacked and referred to in the book of Romans. And chapters are developed and, and passages are dedicated to this idea. Let's remember that in verse 1 when Paul introduces himself, he says, as we saw last week, I am a, an apostle of the gospel of who? God. He's a, he's, it's the gospel of God that reveals the righteousness of God that Paul is preaching. So through the gospel, God's and the righteousness of God is on full display. It's on full display. God is righteous. He's holy. He's perfect. And we aren't, are we? Because we are born completely unrighteous, to reconcile us to himself, God makes us righteous. And he does this in a manner that is righteous and holy and perfectly in tune with who he is. 
It's important that we see that, that in declaring us righteous, God does it righteously. He doesn't take shortcuts in addressing our sinfulness. He doesn't just sweep them under the rug and pretend like it never happened. In order to declare us righteous, he has to do it in a righteous manner. So in the gospel, we see God's righteousness as he declares us righteous through the atoning work of Jesus Christ, which he then confirms through Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. So the gospel both reveals how incredibly righteous, good, and holy God is, and at the same time, it reveals how he has made us righteous so that we can be called sons and daughters of God. And as we dig into this and we see his righteousness unfold in how he declares us righteous and bestows upon us a righteousness that is not our own, but it comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and through his work on the cross, the gospel demands a response from his people. And that response is hallelujah to God be the glory and only God because he does this work in us and for us. God does not bestow this righteousness on us because of some inducement on our part. He does not declare us righteous before him because in some way we've earned it or we have done enough good things or we've achieved certain personal goals or we've become a pretty good person. That's not why God declares us righteous. This passage in verse 17 says it only comes when we confess who we are, our sinfulness. We cry out for God's mercy and we trust in Jesus Christ alone. It's from faith to faith. It's all through faith that this comes into our lives and we are connected to the righteousness of God. Ephesians 2, Paul will write to this church, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. In the gospel, God's righteousness is on full display. So how does this truth intersect with us this week? I want to suggest to you there's a, a handful of applications that the gospel gives us here in this passage. First one is this, that the gospel is good news for all of us, regardless of our position in life. Verse 13, Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. What Paul does in these opening verses is important for us. As you look across this room, we come from many different stations in life. We have different characteristics. Some of us are white. Some of us are not white. Some of us have more money. Some of us have less money. Some of us have lots of education. Others us, of us have very, maybe very little education. Some of us this morning, we come in this room and our lives are going pretty good right now. Life is good. We might even wear that t-shirt and mean it. And others of us, our life looks like a hurricane has hit it. And we're going through deep times of tribulation and pain and suffering. We come from all across the spectrum in this room this morning. And the good news of the gospel is every one of us find our answer in the gospel. Paul gives characteristic or categories here. He says the gospel is for those of you, church, in Rome, those of you who are believers, I want to come and I want to give you the gospel. And I also want to give it to the unbelievers in the city of Rome. I want to give it to the Greek and the barbarian. In other words, I want to give it to those of you who have culture. You're cultured. You know, you like opera or whatever, right? You have culture, you know, like June Sims. And then there's the other side, like Wilson. Sims. 
right? I threw that up. By the way, that just came to my head because I remember June likes to go to opera and Wilson hates it. <laughs> you know? Cultured and uncultured, right? And, or how about this one? Uh, educated and uneducated. That's what he's getting at in these verses. People who are civilized and uncivilized. You, you've, you, you understand, you've been taught, you have manners, you have, uh, you know, all of that, or you don't. And everything in between. New City Church, you're going to Southeast Palm Bay, and you have people down there who are educated, and they have money, and they're sophisticated, they have culture, they're put together, they look good. Ben's moved into their neighborhood. He's made it better. You have all of those people, right? And then you don't. And you've got everything in between. Is your church going to only appeal to one slice? Or like Paul, will it be the entire spectrum of the population that lives in southeast Palm Bay? Well, I would contend it has to be the entire spectrum. And covenant, we as a church, we need to think about the entire spectrum. All are welcome in our church, whether it's covenant or new city, because all are welcome at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. And this is good news for every one of us this morning. When you come into our church this morning, maybe you're new and your life has fallen down around your ears and you're looking for answers. I'm here to tell you, all the lines of discrimination that exist within our culture, they do not exist at the foot of the cross with Jesus Christ. Hey, another application from this passage. The gospel is God's power unleashed in our lives through faith in Jesus Christ. He writes, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The gospel is not a bunch of fine-sounding words or intriguing philosophical concepts. The gospel is not really great life advice that God gives us to put into play to the very best of our abilities according to our skills and our wisdom to, in order to have a better life. Not at all. With the gospel, God powerfully changes us. He brings us into eternal life and salvation, and he brings to the gospel all of his blessings to everyone who believes it. The gospel is the power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. In my run-up studying of this book, it was interesting the number of references I found to, as to an analogy to this idea of power. And in tracing it back, it goes back to the, to the 5th century to a theologian by the name of Theodoret. That's a great name, Theodoret. And, and he lived in, in ancient, what we would now today call Turkey, part of Asia Minor in Turkey. And Theodore was a, a, um, a, a, a pastor and a theologian and a scholar, and he gave an analogy. And when I read his analogy, it immediately made me think of my brother who passed away this spring. Uh, my brother Craig was a, a prankster, a jokester, right? Um, and sometimes uh, he did not mind you suffering at the end of his jokes and pranks. And he just thought it was hilarious. He was stationed in Turkey and he, in the same area that Theodoret um, ministered in the military. And I never forget when Craig came home from the military, he uh, brought some gifts. I was probably 15 at the time. And, and he pulls out these different gifts and he waited till last to bring my mom's gift out, which was just a little mason jar. And in that little mason jar were tiny little peppers. Because he knew that my mom, my mom loved spicy food. She loved, you know, peppers and things like that. She would take the peppers and back to the, the juice. She would always take that juice and pour it across her turnip greens. Now I'm really getting Southern here, right? And then pour that pepper juice across the Southern. And so he brought her this jar full of these little peppers filled with liquid. Saying, here, mom, I brought you something for your greens. And then he says, would you like to try one of them? And she goes, sure. He goes, these are delicious. They, they eat them like candy over in Turkey. And so he pulls out this little pepper, and this thing was only about yay big, right? Okay. And so he gives it to my mom, and he says, Jerry, would you like one? And I said, is it good? He goes, oh, it's delicious. You'll love it. And he gave it to me, right? Well, my mom, you know, she nibbled on it. I was, you know, 14 and dumb and stupid. I just took the whole thing and popped it into my mouth and started chewing it like bubble gum. And y'all are laughing because you know where this is going, right? 
It felt like a nuclear bomb exploded in my mouth. I mean, there's tears, there's snot going everywhere. I mean, it's horrible. I, I go into the kitchen, and church is not an exaggeration. I contorted my body to turn my face upside down in the sink so that the faucet could just pour on my face and in my mouth. This thing was so hot. It was it felt like fire ants had just gone to town inside my mouth, my lips, my esophagus is burning. It's painful. I'm crying, you know. And the whole time my brother is just laughing his keister off. He thinks it's so funny. My mom, tr- no, truth, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I, I heard my mom swear in her, my entire life. I heard her swear less than a handful of times. I mean, I'd have fingers left over if I counted this was one of those occasions, and she colorfully called into question the legitimacy of my brother's parentage. Let's put it that way, okay? I mean, it was so hot, okay? And, and so Theodora said that's what the gospel is like. It's like one of these little peppers, okay? And, and it's not like those peppers that you go into the Mexican you know, grocery store and you look at them and you just instinctively know, stay away, because it's like a rattlesnake. It's gonna, it doesn't look threatening or anything like that. It's unassuming, little, mild-looking, small, little pepper, Theodore says. But when you bite into it, he says, when you bite into it, here comes the heat. Here comes the power, and that's what the gospel is like. The gospel is just like that. At first glance, at first introduction, it may not be very impressive at all from a human evaluation, but when you bite into the gospel, here comes the heat. Here comes the power of God. And it's not that the gospel just brings power. Paul specifically says the gospel is the power of God at work in our lives. This is why we all need the gospel. Christian, it's why we, like Martin Luther, need to be meditating upon the gospel daily because we all need the power of God every single day throughout our day. One final application. With the gospel comes a debt for us to joyfully honor. Paul says in verse 14, I am under obligation. Literally, he says, I am a debtor. I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. What does Paul mean by that? Why would Paul say that with the gospel comes a debt, that he's now a debtor? Well, let me explain it like this. Um, John Boland, where are you at? Come up here, John Boland. So uh, John and his beautiful wife, Gina, were in our covenant group when I first came to Palm uh, to Covenant 11 years ago. And at that time, they had a one little toddler, Tower, and they now have Tower and Noah and Addison and Oliver. Church, this is a shining example of how you're supposed to help your church grow. Okay? <laughs> So you either have them or you bring them, guys. That's the way it works, right? So let me, let me give it an illustration like this. John, um, I have a $20 bill here, okay? I want to give it to you, um, and I want you to give that to Tower and Noah and Addison and Oliver. Split it up among them. Uh, $20 for kids. You can do the math. You're working in that industry. $5 a piece, okay? Would you do that for me? can do that. Okay, he can do that. Now, let me ask you a church, a question, church. Is he a... Yeah. <laughs> My towers over there going, yeah, get it. Good job, son. Let me tell you something. You're going to be doing that so much, you're going to bring in the tears, I promise, as you get older. All right. Uh, hey, you know, uh, he's not a debtor to me in the sense that he came to me and said, Jerry, can I borrow $20? And I, I give him $20, and now what? He owes me $20. He's in debt to me. That's not what Paul is saying here, right? He's saying something that different. You see, I have entrusted $20 to John. He's now going to go back to his seat. He can't give it to him right now, but I am entrusting him to do what? I'm entrusting him to take that $20 to somehow break it and to get Tower and his kids that $5. So he is now got a debt. It's a debt of honor, right? 
He's indebted to who he is as a man of God to deliver what has been entrusted to him. And this is what Paul is getting at here. He's saying, church, the gospel has been entrusted to us. We have a debt. And who are we indebted to? It's to the people in Southeast Palm Bay, New City, where you're being planted. You don't become a part of a church plant, church, for kicks and giggles. It's hard work. And during those times of hard work, what keeps you motivated, what keeps you joyful is knowing I have a debt to deliver. I've been honored and trusted by God. He's given me something so precious. And he's saying, now deliver it to these people that I marked out before the foundations of the world in Southeast Palm Bay. It's your debt. You're indebted to the gospel for the sake of those in Covenant Church, the same is true with us. Why do we come here every year at this time of the year and we make a drive for faith promise missions? It's because we are indebted. God has entrusted to us the gospel. And he said, now deliver it around the world. Plant churches. We're saying we want to help plant 50 churches in the next 10 years with three to five of those churches being like this one right here in our own backyard. That is a huge goal. How's it going to happen? How's it not going to become some onerous obligation that we have? It happens when we recognize the honor that we've been given in Jesus Christ, that as we have received the gospel and it's changed our life, it's changed our standing before God so that we are now righteous sons and daughters of God, we get the honor of caring and stewarding this message to those who God has marked out and intends to make righteous sons and daughters of God. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for the honor of being used by you in this way. Just as you have been faithful to us in your righteousness, to your covenant promises, you have intervened in our lives, you have delivered us from the penalty of our sin through Jesus Christ. Father, help us, give us the grace that we need to be faithful stewards of the gospel. And may the power of your gospel, God, be known by all of us. And for the one here this morning, Lord Jesus, I pray, who is yet to taste the heat of the gospel, to see their life changed by the power, your power that comes through Jesus Christ and the good news, the gospel of his death and burial and resurrection and how he takes up residence in our lives through the spirit for that person who's yet to experience that heat. May even today you work on their heart and their eyes and their minds the way you did Martin Luther 500 years ago. Would you open it? Would you open them to the beauty and the truth and the power of the good news of our Savior Jesus? In his name I pray. Amen.